So this is, this is how I explain my research in two dimensions. And one of the dimensions is sustainability, and the other dimension is corporate governance. And I have yes or no in each quadrant. So I have these four quadrants. And the corporate governance part, and this is actually where I started, is really to understand, my goal here is to understand how the different levels of corporate governance affect strategic decisions. So I look at ownership structures, I look at the board composition, I also look at uh, CEO and top executive pay and incentives. And eventually I sort of uh, became more and more interested to family firm and that's where, where uh, or how I met Eric in, in a conference uh, talking about family firms. The other quadrant is that which is pure sustainability and sustainability is understood here as a very broad concept, very elastic, anything goes into this uh, quadrant, but really trying to understand why firms do what they do when it comes to social issues. Really trying to understand ethical issues, how they manage stakeholders. Um, large part of my research in this area is about environmental strategies and, manage uh, and management and really trying to understand why firms differ uh, in terms of their strategies regarding the, the environment. And the paper I'm going to present is actually fall, uh, falls into, into this quadrant here. Now, I like to believe that my major contribution to the literature is in the intersection of these two. So if I die today, will I be remembered? <laughs> Probably not. But if I am in, in, the, in the academia, most likely will be for the work that I've done in the intersection between corporate governance and, and, and um, sustainability <coughs> or social performance. And here, actually, what I look is how the vi different configuration of corporate governance affect the decisions regarding social issues in firm. And then, of course, I have other papers that are not related to neither sustainability, and, and I've become interested on in smart cities uh, recently, so I have a couple of papers that we're working on. I'm writing a few cases. Uh, I have another piece that is uh, looking at micro enterprises and entrepreneurial firms in uh, um, emerging economies. So this is uh, an, an analysis that I do in Argentinian companies. Uh, and, a, and a bunch of things. It's not, not everything is in here. So just to give you a snapshot of what I, what I do. Um, so what is this paper about? And, and, and as I said, this is perhaps one example of, of an area that I became interested in several years ago, actually when I was uh, a lot younger and I was not even thinking about doing a PhD at that time. Uh, but really looking at how the society in general is changing and is demanding better uh, environmental performance and, uh, to firms and how the, the society uh, is represented or, or is concerned about these issues. And we can look at this from different perspectives, from the consumer perspective. <coughs> more and more we as consumers, you know, are a little bit more conscious about the, 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 the products that we, we buy and we look whether it's organic or not and we, you know, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a great um, survey done by uh, uh, Bonini and Oppenheim, uh, they, they are McKenzie guys and they did this, this super large scale uh, survey around the world and they actually show that a large majority, almost 90% of consumers are really concerned about this. Now, you can say, well, one thing is, is that they are concerned. Are they really willing to pay a premium for those products? And that's where the, the, the field is not, has not agreed. But certainly there's a, a, a concern from, from the consumer point of view. Uh, also, the increased number of NGOs around the world. Um, uh, we, we probably are aware that the number of NGOs has grown a lot over the recent years. Uh, there's a, a study by the Urban Institute that actually compared the different categories of, 
of uh, NGOs, so those dedicated to human rights, those dedicated to poverty, those dedicated to the environment. And the category that has grown the most is those related to the, uh, the environment. Uh, also, from a more economic perspective, uh, there's a, a raise uh, oh, and the creation of new uh, investment funds. Uh, both sides of the Atlantic, both in Europe and North America, has increased significantly over the last few years. Governments are creating agency. Some of them are very old, like the Environmental Protection Agency in the, in the States that was uh, founded in the 70s. Others more recent, like the Minister of Natural Environment in, in Spain. Uh, and also there's sort of pressures from internal groups and external stakeholders to, uh, that are pushing the firms to act more responsible, uh, in, in more responsible ways. So what I'm trying to say here, and this is sort of a long motivation, but what I'm trying to say here in one sentence is that there's an increased pressure towards better environmental performance. Now, how do firms respond to these pressures? Well, it varies, right? It varies, it depends. Uh, one way they respond is by innovating, is by creating new solutions, new products, new processes new services that actually minimize or eliminate sort of the environmental harm that products and services uh, and companies in general uh, do. And this is the focus of the paper. Uh, at the end, if I have time, I, I understand I have about an hour. Uh, if I have time, I'll, I'll talk about another project that I'm working on that actually looks at different not only innovation, but other forms of responding to this, to this pressure. So the, the research question, and really trying to, to be clear on what we're trying to, to do here, we want to know how the different institutional pressures affect the propensity uh, of innovate regarding or, or to produce environmental related innovation. And I know this is going to YouTube, so I'm not sure whether I should talk about this or not, but let me tell you a little bit of, of, of the backstage of this, of this paper. This paper was intentionally, or, or, sorry, originally intended to uh, be uh, an a-theoretical paper. No theory, phenomenon-centric, and we wanted to know basically when you look at the literature on innovation, uh, sort of the standard, and here we have experts, so I'm, 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 please correct me if I'm wrong, but one thing that is assumed is that innovations is sort of a, a proactive initiative that comes from the, the firms to take advantage of a market opportunity, or is, uh, is done to get an edge over rivals, or is done to uh, anticipate what others uh, competitors will do. Now, talking to managers uh, that are working with environmental innovations, they basically said, well, this is not really the case in our case. What, what happens to us, we innovate in this uh, area, not because we necessarily believe there's a market opportunity, is because we feel the pressure that this is what we need to do. So we wanted to do that, to analyze that, we, whether innovation when it comes to the environment is something that is proactive or is something that is more reactive. It's actually a, a, a consequence of pressures that are non-market pressures. Um, but as part of, and, and actually this was intended to be a research note, not a full-blown article. This was only uh, intended to be a research note. But, uh, this is a great example on how the review process affects your work. <laughs> I mean, if you, we have about 60 versions of this paper. Imagine, eight years. I mean, we wrote 60 versions. If you compare the first version to the last version, you're going to see uh, a lot of changes. So we have an a theoretical paper. We uh, submitted it. We got it back saying, well, you need theory for this. You need something. You need, you need to frame it some, 
some way. Uh, so we use uh, institutional theory and we have this super nice uh, development on, on institutional theory and you know we came up with new constructs and new ideas and so we got back from the reviewer saying no you you overdid it right so you did too much we didn't want that uh, it was perhaps too much and now if you look at the at the version of the paper it's in my view is very thin on, on theory, uh, but this is actually the result of the review process. So um, how do we define environmental innovation? And I'll talk about theory in a minute. Uh, we use the, the Brunner, Meyer, and Cohen uh, definition that basically is, talks about products, processes, and services aimed at reducing environmental harm. So one assumption that our paper makes and we assume it as a valid assumption, is that f if firms engage in this sort of uh, innovation, they are effective, at least in reducing pollution or in reducing the environmental harm. Uh, is this a valid assumption? Uh, we like to believe that, yes, it is. This is a question I always ask my, my students. When you make assumption, is it a valid assumption? And I think it is. And the reason that I think it is a valid assumption is because firms have a very broad portfolio, a very broad portfolio of, of um, initiatives that they can take that are uh, cheaper, that are easier to implement, and and not necessarily efficient in terms of reduction. So if they do it just because they want to be or they want to show that they're green, they have better alternative. If they engage in these long processes of innovating on investing money, time, people, it's because they do expect to have a concrete output. And the output in this particular case would be an improvement on... Uh, on the pollution levels, okay? So I was talking about theory. We, we eventually we frame it in, in institutional theory. Uh, I know in this house there are some experts in, in institutional theory. Uh, and this is my view of institutional theory. And, I'll, and I, I apologize in advance if I'm offending anyone, but basically, I, I, I identify four branches of institutional theory. One is the one that most of us know, which is the, now I would call it the old neo-institutionalism, which is basically the idea that institution exert pressures over firms and, and uh, firms respond by imitating the dominant players in the, in the organizational field. And this is a morphic process of course. So that's what explains why firms are similar. This is the, perhaps the more traditional one. Uh, the other one, that the problem with that one is does not explain heterogeneity among firms. And Christine Oliver, about 30 years ago, said, well, actually, you know, to these pressures that are, uh, that comes from the institutions, you can actually see divergent responses because firms strategically decide how to respond. So it might comply, they might comply, firms may comply to their request of the institutions, but they may comply in different ways. They may actually resist, they may actually uh, ignore this pressure, and this is uh, also widely used in, in environmental management literature trying to explain why firms differ when the, the institution is exerting pressure. Somehow implicit in, this, in, this, in these two views is the idea that institutions are relatively homogeneous. So the pressures are somehow identical and firms, uh, again, either do as the others do or do these different things, but the level of, of, of pressure is the same. A third sort of branch is those that are related to uh, institutional change and institutional strategy. I cited Tom, uh, hoping that he was going to be here. He's not, well. 
But he, he, he basically talks, I mean, and this is the first to the one above, basically in the sense that it is actually the organization that is an active actor changing the institution. It's not that the institution generates different responses, it's actually the, the organization that is able to create, modify, or perhaps even kill or eliminate institution uh, by becoming an active, an active uh, member. So the institutional structure is changed by this uh, organization. And there's, there's a fourth, and this is where I try to fit my, my work, in which the assumption that the institutions are somehow homogeneous is, is not relevant anymore. They might have the similar ultimate goal, in this case environmental performance, but the level of pressure their exercise is different. The mechanisms they use to, uh, to uh, reach their goals are different, and the type of legitimacy that they grant is different. And there's also a difference in the way organizations respond. So I don't know how you can call this, maybe uh, I don't know, double-sided heterogeneity. I don't know if there's a formal label, but this is what we use. So we, we assume that there are different or, uh, institutions that exert different levels of pressure, uh, and they have different mechanisms. So when looking at the relevant um, institutions when it comes to corporate environmentalism, we focus on two, regulators and uh, NGOs. And we link that to what Scott called the, the, the pillars of uh, to understand organizational behavior. He basically said that we, there are three basic pillars. Regula uh, regulation, norms, and cognition. And we decided to focus on the first two. Why? Well, 10 years after he, he, uh, Scott m mentioned these three pillars, he said that the, the two most important ones was the regulators and the norms. We used that as an excuse. Uh, the, the truth is that we didn't have data on cognition. Uh, so, uh, so we, I mean, and you're gonna see in the arguments, the argument is that the more pressure, the more innovation. That's, in a nutshell, what we argue. The more pressure, whether it comes from the regulation or whether it comes from NGO, this will lead to higher innovation. Uh, but the mechanism, and this is something that eventually it was deleted from the final version of the paper, but in the most developed uh, uh, version of, of the paper was somehow explained, we basically say that the regulation that is often represented by the government uh, has certain mechanisms that are very clear. There are the formal mechanisms. So this, uh, the government is the one that establishes the law that sort of create the normative that also have co concrete uh, enforcing, uh, enforcing mechanism. They can apply economic penalties. They can suit the company. I mean, there's a number of mechanisms, of formal mechanisms that Regulator, uh, regulators enjoy and they can apply it to make the firm comply to what they want. In this case, better environmental performance. So what we argue here is that the regulator, the type of legitimacy that they provide is the formal license to operate. If you don't get the approval from the regulator, basically what you have is not only that you're illegitimate, you're illegal, right? So the regulator basically has the power to recognize or deny the organization existence. Now, the, the, the more, the greater the pressure that is received by the firms, by the regulator, the, na the greater the need for compliance. And one clear way that you show that you want to comply and you have an in an intention to comply is by involving in green innovation. Green innovation, because it's costly, it takes time, it is uncertain, really acts as a very strong signal that shows 
that those institutions concerned with uh, environmental issues will get what they want. So this is one of the arguments. Um, the, the, the other argument is that what the regulator really looks at is the final outcome. So is the improvement of pollution levels. So the company pollute less, basically. Uh, they don't really care about other alternatives. They don't care what we call in the paper ceremonial conformity. They don't care if you use an eco label. You don't care if you have a green trademark. They don't. I mean, at the end, what they're looking is improvement in uh, in, uh, in 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 pollution levels. And there's, I would say, a clear or a majority of agreement in the environmental management literature that actually says that in the way to achieve improvements in pollution level is through innovation. Okay? Uh, the literature sort of have these two categories, pollution control and end of pipe solutions. Uh, what really provides value in terms of society is strategies that are related to pollution uh, prevention and one that is along this line is green innovation or green patenting. And this is what we argue. So we expect that as the environmental regulatory pressure increase, the environmental innovation will increase accordingly. Now, how many of you have read the paper? I was going to ask how many of you read the footnotes of the paper, but <laughs> Don't worry, I, I won't put you in, in, in a spot. I do that with my students. Um, one of the concerns that the, one of our viewers had is that, well, these arguments that the more pressure you get from the government, the more innovative you will be, is the argument that uh, Michael Porter uh, did in his HBR article regarding uh, uh, environmental issues. But he basically says that there's a market opportunity. We, we're not talking really about market opportunities here. What we're basically arguing is that green innovation is a mechanism to achieve the formal license to operate. Where in these organizational fields where these elements are important. Why? Because they, th this is the channel to get legitimacy both formal, and as I'm going to explain in a minute, informal, which is the other part, is the normative pressure. We focus also on, on the normative pressure. And the theory basically argues that um, the normative pressure often comes from professional organization and other institutions that are uh, focal actors in, in the organizational firms. They define the proper behaviors and norms these norms and behaviors are often implicit, unlike in the case of the regulator that, are, that can be checked. You can actually read the law, read the normative, understand what's going on. These are implicit norms that are uh, assumed as uh, legitimate. And one of the, of the um, institutions that are relevant in this context, we argue, is environmental NGOs. Environmental NGOs can, uh, and there's actually some, some evidence, can uh, create new standards to push firms beyond the regulation that is uh, mandatory uh, in, a, in a given field. Uh, the mechanisms that they use are different. They don't have sort of, they cannot impose economic penalties. They, they cannot uh, enforce, I mean, the way they enforce is in a rather informal way. So they can certainly suit the company, but they're normally using uh, issues like boycott or they exercise their voice. So they don't have the power to eventually close your plant or close your firm as the government does, but it can certainly harm your image, your reputation, your, uh, the public appreciation of your organization. Stephanie. So the, the only point I would add is that um, 
environmental regulation is increasingly socially negotiated in the sense that uh, much environmental reg regulation now um, is risk-based. And so as a result of that, ENGOs and other actors actually participate in the regulatory process. And, and companies are required often to consult with them in order to defend what <coughs> threshold that they, if they're trying to lower or, or raise the threshold that they're, right. that they're applying to to their regulator, they're often required to take this into account. So I think it's not as clean as you're making it out to be. Um, I, 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 yes and no. Let, let me, let me, yeah, I agree. It, it, it happens uh, on occasions. But it is also true if the, this process is fully incorporated. So this process in which the firm consult the, 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 the NGO and then is negotiated with the regulator and we all agree that this should be the, the, the sort of the standard that we should meet. My argument is that perhaps NGO would, wouldn't exist, wouldn't be there eventually, right? So we all agree, they disappear. Right? Uh, we wouldn't see boycotts. We wouldn't see, I mean, we wouldn't see um, uh, 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 you know, uh, active members and activists talking uh, trash about a firm. If the regulation is there, you simply enforce the regulation through the regulator. Right? So the expectations from NGOs, I would argue, is normally beyond that. Otherwise, there's really no need, I mean, for, for them to, to exist. And I agree. So the process has been improved and sort of we, we now see more roundtables and people talking and trying to agree. But I, my, my, my view is that it's not, it's not fully integrated. Having your comment in, in mind or, or trying to, to, to understand um, that issue, one paper that we're developing, in, in, and again at the end I'll, I'll, I'll try to explain, is, uh, and again you, you can do the same uh, criticism, but it's actually looking at the extent to which, because one, one argument for the existence of NGO is the institutional void, right? The government do not it's not fast enough to create the regulation, so these new forms of organization emerge, and they try to sort of cover that void that is provided by, by, by sort of the lack of action from the government or the regulator, right? So in one paper, um, we're actually trying to see to what extent these are sort of substitutes forces or actually compl complementary forces uh, in the process of environmental improvement. So, as same as, as in the case of the regulator, we argue that uh, green innovation will act as a behavioral indicator uh, and sort of shows the commitment. So in that sense, the argument is the same. But we also, and this is somehow related to what you, uh, Stephanie was saying, that in occasion, uh, NGOs can facilitate the creative process. They actually participate in helping the firm become more environmentally responsible. Um, you were talking about uh, social movement. The work by King actually shows that even if they don't actively participate inside the, the company, the pressures from NGOs can create internal tensions in the organization, and that internal tension eventually will derive in change and innovation. So we, we sort of follow that part in, in, in the argument. So we expect that the relationship between uh, normative pressures arising from NGOs or environmental issues increase, the environmental innovation will also uh, increase. Um, so these are the two baseline hypotheses. We say, well, what happened when two firms face identical pressure do they behave in the same way or do they change? Or you also see heterogeneity in the responses. And we argue that there might be some heterogeneity here. And here's where we look at the moderators. 
Uh, we look at two uh, groups. One, uh, what we call the deficiency gap as, as a moderator. Uh, a firm is displaying, we say that a firm is displaying a deficiency gap uh, when they are polluting relatively more than the industry peers. So whatever is the industry average in terms of pollution, the farther away they are from that average, the greater the deficiency gap. And that deficiency gap will make the, uh, the firm much more visible and a target for, um, for these institutions that actually are expecting to behave more responsibly. Um, we also have a paper that actually shows that uh, this greater scrutiny uh, will make more cosmetic actions less efficient. So they really, I mean, those that are very far away from the average, the only mechanisms that they actually have to regain that uh, legitimacy is by showing very substantive action. And again, we argue that green innovation might be the vehicle uh, for, for that. Um, there's also some evidence, uh, Magali, our colleagues Magali, uh, Delmas, and Mavic Toffel actually shows that those, mar those managers in firms that are lagging behind in terms of environmental performance are much more sensitive to, to environmental pressure. Uh, so they are likely to input greater value to environmental projects that can help regain that legitimacy uh, loss. So we expect that the link between the pressures uh, from the institution and the environmental innovation will be stronger the larger the deficiency gap. Okay. Uh, and the second set of uh, moderators are related to resources. And here we look at two dimensions of resources. Um, one is organizational slack. And here the logic is quite straightforward. The more slack the organization has, the greater uh, possibility to explore different alternatives, the faster and the more efficient their innovation is going to be. They can attract better talent. They can be... Uh, uh, they can uh, explore more, more, alternative, uh, more alternatives. So we expect that the relationship between pressures and innovation will be stronger the higher the organization and slack. And we also look at asset specificity. So uh, asset specificity is, uh, refers to those investments that are durable, that are specialized assets, and that cannot be easily redeployed. So in the extreme case that the, either the regulator or the, um, or the NGOs withdraw any form of, le of, of legitimacy and sort of force the company to, to close, what do the owners do with those assets? Uh, the more specific, the harder the time to actually sell those assets to, um, in, in, in the market. So uh, business failures, so at the extreme, the business failure will be very costly to, to, the, to them. And, and this is when sort of the, the review process comes in, right? So at the very beginning, clear measures, clear relationship, no theory. We had to come up with these notions of the efficiency gap, right? So it's, uh, uh, but I explain how I actually measure that. So let, let, me, let me go to, to, the, to the methods uh, uh, part. Uh, so we focus on the 20 most polluting uh, industries in the, in the United States. And this is based on the toxic release inventory uh, produced by the Environmental Protection Agency in the, in the States. Uh, so we cross-reference, and I'm going to talk about some of the, um, of, the, um, of the sources of the data. We eventually cross-reference, I think we have five different sources of information. We ended up with an unbalanced, balance, uh, an, an unbalanced panel of over 300 publicly traded uh, U.S. firms uh, for the period 97, 2001, so it's five years. Uh, the way we uh, measure environmental innovation. Um, there, uh, there was this paper by uh, Namerov and colleagues 
Uh, this is a research policy paper. And uh, this author, basically what they did is they uh, analyzed the CH, uh, CHI uh, patent site data, uh, data set that actually gathers data from the US Patent Office in the, in, in the States. And, um, and they went through a very painstaking, meticulous process of identifying green patents. Using keywords, they developed this program that was basically searching for the entire uh, data set. We're, we're talking about millions of entries here. And the great thing about this is that they made the results available for everybody. So they actually made it public. They focused uh, basically on uh, green chemistry, and this was an issue. It's not all the, um, all the green patents, because you can patent beyond chemistry. Um, at some point, this became an issue for, some, uh, for one of the reviewers. What is very interesting to see is that when you look at innovation, uh, green innovation in chemistry is not only exclusive of the chemistry industry. It actually, it only out of the, the total patents that it was found here, it was over uh, 1,500 patents. Uh, about a third belonged to the chemistry industry. The other uh, two thirds belong to the different industry in, in the sample. So this is, uh, again, not a perfect and ideal measure of the entire level of green patenting in the States, uh, but it's, it's, I think it's a good approximation. Uh, now, if you, if you want to replicate that, it would be much easier. Uh, actually, the US uh, Patent and Trade Trademark Office uh, in the States uh, has a category that is related to green innovation. Uh, we actually checked that for that time, and we only found 52 patents for that period. Uh, but it didn't mean that people were not doing patent. They wouldn't put it in that category at, at that time. Now. They sort of moved a lot of them into into this category, and people are and, and companies are more and more keen to to associate their patents to this category. Uh, we the way we measure is by counting citations, patent citations. Um, again, here there's experts on on how to measure. Back or forward. It, it is forward, forward. Um, we did several uh, robustness checks, so we, we use patent counts only, we use patent counts plus citation, we use uh, backward citation plus forward citation, uh, we used uh, weighted, uh, patents weighted by citation. Pretty much all the results are, are, are robust to these alternative uh, measures. Um, the way we measure regulatory pressure, uh, we use the Environmental Council of States uh, reports, uh, or ECOS reports. They basically gather information about uh, two things. Uh, regulated entities, what they call regulated entities, and these are uh, entities that are regulated <laughs> by definition, but basically is sites for instance, landfills or facilities, plants, company plants, or accidents at the state level. So any landfill facility that uh, are considered that needs to be regulated are counted in these uh, in these reports, and they also measure the number of inspections conducted by each state. So we basically what we did is created a ratio between inspections and regulated sites. So that indicator basically tells you at the state level how many inspections uh, each uh, regulated entity gets, basically. Uh, but we needed to have sort of individual measures for, for firms. And the way we did it is we look at the Orbis uh, data set and created a uh, a weighted measure 
by looking at the location of the subsidiaries of the firm. So depending on how many subsidiaries you had in each state, we consider the value of the state and weight it uh, by the number of, of, um, of subsidiaries uh, that the firm had in that state. So unless two firms had the exact same number of, um, of uh, subsidiaries and these subsidiaries are located exactly in the same geographical space, values differ from firm to firm, okay? So this, and this uh, measure was, uh, we, we, we log uh, transform it and then we standardize it and this will have an impact, I'll, I'll tell you when, when I talk about marginal effects. Uh, the way we measure normative pressure is by uh, using the number of environmental pressures uh, per year at the state level. We got this information from the Nas National Center of Charitable Statistics and the process in which we created the, this measure was similar to the one here. So we tried to have a weighted, um, a weighted measure by the number of subsidiaries. Um, so again, here we assuming that if you're in a state with a lot of, a lot of NGOs, the pressure that you're gonna get is a lot. Right? So, and, and same thing with the regulation, right? So the more inspections per uh, regulated entity, the greater pressure that the company is going to feel. The way I, I, we measure the efficiency gap is by, uh, uh, is by uh, taking into account the emissions at the first, of, first at the plant level compared to the average of the, uh, of the industry. We use five-digit seed code. Um, and then we sort of sum up those difference uh, per parent uh, company. One thing that is uh, important to mention here is that these emissions we weighted by toxicity, and this is consistent uh, with the work that I've done in the in the past. We use the human uh, toxicity potential uh, factor that basically tells you how how, how harmful each. Um, chemical is to the human health. And it, it's important because it looks at uh, the different media that is released. Uh, so it's whether it's land, whether it's air, whether it's um, uh, land, air, and water. Um, there's a, a, a number of issues uh, regarding this. Uh, we also calculated and weighted a measure of this because uh, one problem that this has is that not all the, the chemicals included in the, in the inventory are also covered by the toxicity uh, potential. Uh, results are the same, but we prefer this one because we, felt, we feel that it's a little bit more precise. And we're talking about uh, the impact on human health. So we have a clear um, Measure. Organization and Slack, going to Ian's questions, uh, we measure, and this is quite uh, common in, 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 in the literature, in, in two ways, the ratio of working capital to sales and the ratio between the net incomes and, and revenue, so it's basically the profit margin, uh, assuming that this will give more Slack or more possibilities to the firm uh, to, to, to explore. Asset specificity, we follow Siedonis, uh, uh, and it's the logarithm of the ratio of the book value of a firm machinery and equipment to the number of employees. Uh, uh, we computed uh, alternative measures, uh, and, 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 and results are quite uh, uh, robust. We control for R&D intensity, the number of patents, the firm size, the sector, and we also include year uh, fixed effects and the model that we use because we have uh, citation counts. Uh, uh, we, we, thought, we first thought about a Poisson, uh, but uh, because the, the dependent variable was overly um, dispersed, we, we sort of need uh, something that account for that uh, over dispersed uh, 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 characteristic and uh, negative binomial fits uh, best. 
uh, we, we, we did, um, and also the Lagrange multiplier indicates that this is the right model to, to apply in this case, uh, compared to a Poisson. We, in, in any case, this paper, one characteristic that it has, if you read the paper, in, in several locations it tells you uh, alternative uh, estimations are available upon request from the authors. Mm -hmm. This paper has I don't know how many tables and estimation. I mean, it's absurd the number of estimations that we run, uh, really trying to show that uh, results were, were, were robust. So we have the Poisson, we have the negative binomial, we have even uh, OLS, and, and results uh, remain the same. You had a, no. Uh, well, we lacked uh, the independent variables two years. Why two years? Who knows? I mean, <laughs> reviewers, right? So, so I love them. Uh, just, just, I mean, we just for, to, I mean, for our peace of mind, we did one year uh, lag, we did three year lags, and and, and results uh, remain uh, almost unchanged in most cases. Um, so uh, uh, about the, the 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 results. So for the controls, larger firms in innovate more in, in, in green uh, or, or have a greater propensity to innovate in green uh, patents. And there's also uh, a, a positive and significant coefficients for uh, total patents and, and, and R&D uh, intensity, which you can here we, we can play about the notion of uh, abstract um, of absorptive capacity and how firms that already are doing uh, innovation are in a better position to innovate in, in uh, environmental related uh, 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 issues. Uh, but about our, our, um, our hypothesis, uh, the, the one and, and, and two uh, indicated a regulated positive relationship between uh, regulative and normative pressures. We found positive and significant coefficient for both of them. And here in the brackets you, you see are the, the marginal effects. Uh, marginal effects basically allows you to somehow capture the... Uh, so is really to understand the, the... One way to understand the effect size of, of that given variable. So it's how an increase of one unit of the independent of the independent variable affects the dependent variable, assuming the rest remains constant. Now the problem is that these variables are log transform and standardized, so you, you cannot really do that. So we went through a, a whole process of deconstructing the variable and reestimating. And and we basically what we have is that uh, one hundred additional inspection would lead uh, to 0 0.5 addition, additional citations on green chemistry and 10 additional NGOs would lead to uh, 0 0.35 additional citation. Is this a lot or not? Well, when you compare it to the sample mean of, of these uh, variables, you're going to see that inspection, the average is uh, 519, for NGOs is 58, and for uh, citations to the environmental patents, the average is 0 0.42. So one way of looking at this is that an increase of 20% on the average sample of the regulatory pressure, so if, if the regulator is able to increase an average of 100 additional inspection, that's 20% of what they have, this will have an impact of 119% on the average citation, okay? And I know some people are saying, what, that much? Well, this is how, you know, w you actually try to uh, assess marginal effects, right? And of course, this assuming that the rest remains unchanged, which is hard to believe, uh, but um, we, we calculated that. So apparently the, the, the effect size are quite strong in, in both cases. Uh, regarding the interaction, uh, the deficiency gap uh, interacted with the regulatory and normative pressures, uh, um, produced a positive and, and significant coefficient. For the case of organizational slack, we got significant coefficient, 
but the interaction between organization and Slack and regulatory pressure, the sign is negative. And I'll talk about uh, the interpretation of this. So here we have mixed results. And our last hypothesis that talk about uh, uh, asset specificity, uh, we also found uh, a positive and significant uh, coefficients for the, for the interaction uh, finding support. So these results are pretty much robust to a number of elements that I already mentioned, different measures of dependent variable, different measures of in, uh, independent variables. Uh, there was an issue that uh, there was also uh, a lot of zeros for the for the R and D expenditure, which is quite common in CompuStat. So we control for that because you don't know is, if it is a missing value or whether it is that they invested zero that particular year. No, no problem with that. So we we, we conducted a number of of uh, a robustness uh, check. Um, so some, some conclusions, and the conclusion basically is that we, we show some evidence that institutional pressures can trigger environmental innovation, in particular in those firms that are, that are lagging behind, and this is, the effect is going to be greater in, in this firm. Um, this also is a, uh, this effect is stronger in those firms that have asset uh, specificity, uh, specificity. Uh, but when it talks about um, slack and resources, then the situation is a little bit different. So why is that firms with a lot of, res of, of resources uh, are not able to translate regulatory pressure into innovation? One argument that we do is that uh, firms with a lot of slack uh, perhaps prefer to pay the economic penalty, the, go through the legal process that, uh, that the regulator may impose on him, rather than engage in this type of, uh, in this type of processes, uh, which is interesting because when you compare this to the normative pressure, this doesn't happen. So money is good for perhaps, I mean, companies with money, might have more alternative to respond to the regulator, perhaps doing something else. Uh, but when it comes to normative pressures uh, emanating from NGOs, this is not the case. They really need to show a more substantive and, and definitive response. Uh, theoretical contribution, I don't think this is really a theoretical paper, but somehow it talks or reinforces the idea that institutional <coughs> pressures can lead to uh, heterogeneity. In this particular case, it can lead to even innovation. Um, and, and regarding managerial contribution, I think there are two interesting uh, insights. One is that uh, in general, managers, and we all try to avoid pressures. Uh, there might be a bright side of, of pressures. They might actually act as a source of inspiration. It can sort of lead to a, a creative process and, and spur innovation. And the other insight for manager, I think, is that green innovation may actually be a single vehicle to respond to different institution and stakeholders. Stakeholder management, or, or part of it, suggests that you have to tailor your responses according to each stakeholder. Maybe green innovation is a vehicle, a unique element that is able to satisfy all, um, all constituencies that are concerned about the, uh, the environment. Uh, we don't talk because we, ha we had a, a space constraint about uh, contributions to regulators and NGOs, but I think for NGOs, uh, I think it's interesting to, perhaps the, the, the insight for them is that one thing they may want to look at when they target companies for, for their action is their resource profile. Uh, so really targeting those firms that actually are able to do something. Uh, I know this is sort of a leap from, from the data uh, to, to concrete uh, specific, but I think, again, uh, 
the more resources a firm have, uh, the greater chances that are able to translate pressures from the NGOs into actual innovation. So what, what is next? Uh, we have this paper that actually looks at a broader portfolio of environmental actions, not only environmental um, uh, innovation, but other type of environmental actions, and we look at how it affects environmental legitimacy. So really trying to, I mean, the way you can look at it is what is the social value of the different environmental action, and in this particular case, whether environmental innovation has greater social value than other alternatives. Um, I'm not gonna tell you the results of this, and so you can invite me again and bore you again. Uh, but it's quite advanced. I mean, we, we, it's in second round of review in SMJ. Um, it's another paper that has changed uh, significantly over, over the years. Um, I have another paper that I'm running with uh, one of the co-authors here and a colleague from France uh, look it, uh, looking at the economic value and one issue that uh, Ian uh, was, was mentioning and really trying to understand sort of what are the market incentives for, 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 uh, for this. Uh, the other paper that I mentioned, really trying to understand substitute and complements and how markets and non-market forces go together, <coughs> they complement or actually are, may act as, as substitutes. I'm doing that with, uh, with one of my PhD students uh, back in, in Spain. And I have uh, this other paper that actually focus on uh, power and experience of CEOs and see how they can translate this pressure into, into corporate greening depending on the level of experience and, and, uh, and, and power. Um, that's under review in AMJ. So uh, that's it, thank you very much.